Hey everybody, it's TJ. Welcome to another episode of Smash Ultimate Countdown. Boy, do we have a busy one for you. As far as Smash Ultimate news goes, this week was epic. Seemingly out of nowhere, Nintendo dropped a dedicated Smash Bros. Ultimate Direct, and let me tell you, it did not disappoint. So needless to say, it dominated the news cycle for the week. The Direct is almost 30 minutes long, so rather than give you a detailed play-by-play, -play, I'm gonna give you more of a summarized breakdown, highlight the parts that stuck out to me, and pepper in a little bit of my own personal opinion. If you want to experience every glorious detail, Honestly, I think the best thing you could do is check out the Direct. Nintendo has it on their YouTube channel, and it's definitely worth the watch. I'm gonna try to roll through this week's news as succinctly as possible, but it might stretch out a little long. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. At the top of the week, Nintendo showcased a character highlight for Samus of Metroid fame. With the charge shot, missile, and bomb, to me, Samus represents the classic retro video game gunner. My first experience with Samus dates all the way back to the original title on the original NES, and I have to say it never really grabbed me. While I did think that the character was cool and I really liked the way that she controlled, I did have a problem with constantly getting lost, and for a seven-year-old, it was a little bit of a hurdle that I never was able to overcome, so I could never get through the game. And I found that to be a consistent trend with Metroid games moving forward is, I, it's not that I have a problem with backtracking, it's just that I don't like not knowing where I'm supposed to go, and if that stretches out for too long, then it does impede the gaming experience for me personally. The first time I was really able to sink my teeth in with Samus as a character was Smash Brothers 64, and I couldn't believe how well her moves translated from the original NES game into that uh, fully rendered Smash Brothers space. She became one of my favorite characters to play as, and while I'm not much of a fan of guns, and I'm not much of a fan of the Metroid series, I find Samus to be a tremendously compelling character. And come on, throughout the entire history of gaming, I don't know that there has ever been a more amazing and impressive reversal than if you beat the game with Samus and she removes the helmet and you realize that this character you've been playing with throughout the whole game that you presumably assumed was a man or a male of some type is a woman. And Nintendo didn't present it as if it was that big of a deal. Samus just takes off the helmet and's like, yeah, what's up? Yeah, I'm the baddest bounty hunter of the galaxy, say something. Well, Nintendo certainly has their fair share of damsels in distress, Samus has always swam against that current. She's the original gaming leading lady, and she's obviously a great fit for Smash. The featured item for the week is the bomber. You pick up this bad boy with A, and then you have exactly 1.5 seconds until it detonates. The explosion is quite substantial, and anybody within its radius will suffer the consequences However, uh, the closer you are to the center of the blast, the more significant the damage. So you want to kind of get away as fast as you can. At first I was a little confused if it affected the person who detonated the bomb because they are obviously right in the center of the blast radius. But we did get to briefly see it in action in the direct and it didn't seem to impact the person who set it off at all. So you see someone pick that thing up, you better run. The next item on the Smash blog is the actual Direct itself. As I said, it launched on Wednesday, and it delivered a deluge of amazing Smash Brothers information. Going into the Direct, a lot of people felt like they already knew a lot about the game. I kind of had the opposite opinion. I felt like they talked a lot about the minutia of the game. They began with the physics and the balancing at E3. They let you know that all the characters were there. But as far as how you actually experienced the game, we didn't know anything about modes other than Smash, obviously. So I felt like there was a lot of room for them to reveal a considerable amount of information, which they did, as well as answering a lot of questions that I had. It also raised a lot more questions that I hadn't even considered in the first place. But I don't want to dive too deep into that bottomless pit. Instead, let's focus on the opening scene of Wednesday's Direct, which also happens to be the next bullet point on the Smash blog. All right, I can't hold it in. Simon Belmont is in Super Smash Brothers. Woo! I cannot believe it. Anyone who's been following my content knows when the Smash Ballad went up years ago, I voted for Simon Belmont. I've been pushing for Simon Belmont forever. I'm a huge Simon Belmont fi fan. Castlevania was one of the first video game franchises that I ever played on the original NES. Actually, when the NES first came out, it came with the pack-in of Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. So that was the first game I ever played. Second game I ever played, Castlevania. I was immediately pulled in by the music and the game mechanics and the upgrading of the whip and all of these horrible, classic, iconic monsters that you have to take down stage by stage as you're traversing Dracula's castle. The gothic graphics and tone, even for an 8-bit game, it was impressive looking. The whole experience was just something that was extremely impactful in my early video gaming days. Very shortly thereafter, I would fall in love with Link from Legend of Zelda and Little Mac from Punch-Out! But I would say that those three games are the trilogy that represents my original gaming core. My holy gaming retro trilogy is Legend of Zelda, Punch-Out!, and Da -da -da -da, Castlevania, and now I can play as all three of those characters in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. <sighs> what a time to be alive. Thank you, Mr. Sakurai, for making 
this boy's dream come true. And Simon Belmont looks amazing. He looks exactly how I pictured him in my head, being updated for Smash. He moves exactly how I imagined his moves would work in Smash. He even has the omnidirectional whip that was featured in Super Castlevania 4 for the Super Nintendo. One of my favorite games of all time. The reveal trailer was also amazing. You have Luigi with his poltergust exploring Dracula's castle trying out his device on all of these real monsters, and they don't seem to have too much of an effect. It culminates to poor Luigi ultimately having his soul rent from his body by death himself, but not a moment later, Simon Belmont steps in, and I don't want to say saves the day, because it might be a little bit too late for our friend Luigi, but he avenges our green-clad friend. I, I don't know what, what else can be said. I don't know that I can truly express my excitement about this fact. I I'm sure there have to be people out there as excited about Simon Belmont as me, so yay us! I'm so happy that Nintendo has the kind of relationship with these third-party companies that they can get these characters in there. I know Simon Belmont is a Konami character, but because I experienced him on Nintendo systems, to me, he'll, he'll always be a Nintendo character in my heart. And if that isn't amazing enough, we also get Richter Belmont. He's an Echo Fighter, the first Echo Fighter of a third-party character. Does that open the door to others? Who knows? Is there a Miss Pac-Man in our future? That would be pretty cool. Now, I gotta tell you, I don't have as strong of an emotional connection to Richter Belmont as I do Simon and Trevor Belmont, who's featured in Castlevania 3, Dracula's Curse, also for the NES. If I'm not mistaken, his games gravitate more towards the Metroidvania genre than classic Castlevania. And for all the same aforementioned reasons about why I can't really get too into the Metroid games, I feel the same way about the Metroidvania genre in general. The upgrading progression combined with being lost all the time. My real life sense of direction is actually just as bad as my gaming sense of direction. I don't know, I could get lost inside my own bathroom. Sakurai does go on to say that even though Richter Belmont is the Echo, probably because he came after Simon Belmont originated the role in the first Castlevania game, but the way that he was built, a lot of the moves that Simon Belmont uses were first used by Richter. So Simon is more of a vampire killer amalgamation, which is awesome. Cherry picked the best moves from all the games. The way he moves and the feeling his techniques conjure up in me watching him perform them against the other fighters on the screen is so reminiscent of what I remember from Castlevania games. Sakurai's attention to detail and commitment to faithfully recreating these characters in Smash is legendary. The man is a rock star. I could go on about this forever, but it's a long direct, so let's keep the show rolling. At the end of the direct, we were unsurprisingly treated to another character reveal trailer. This has become an ongoing motif. Ridley was revealed at the end of the E3 Smash presentation. Greninja and Charizard were revealed at the end of a Smash Direct for the Wii U cycle. So I think everybody expected that there was going to be one more thing. One more thing has kind of become an ongoing expectation, I suppose, where Smash is concerned. So unsurprisingly, after they wrap it all up, our one more thing puts us right inside Donkey Kong's Jungle Treehouse. Immediately I'm thinking, well, this has got to be either King K. Rule or Funky Kong or Dixie Kong. Are we looking at another Another monkey echo fighter and then once we start hearing the boom boom I'm like well that's got to be King K rule he's the only guy heavy enough out of the whole Donkey Kong country character roster to be able to actually shake the jungle treehouse there in all his silhouette glory is none other than King K rule the original big bad from the Super Nintendo Donkey Kong Country series. He's been out of the loop for a while. We have not seen him in any of these subsequent titles. He was not featured in Donkey Kong Returns, not in Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze. But for gamers of my generation, he's still the villain most closely connected with Donkey Kong. And there's been a big push to get him into the game for a long time. So while people are jumping for joy, yay, King K. Rule is finally in the game. All of a sudden, whoosh, the costume is thrown off to reveal, not King K. Rule, but King DDD. Laughing and jumping around and making all kinds of Looney Tunes noises. He's trolling Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong, but also I think Mr. Sakurai is trolling us. Not only is King DDD dressing in the King K. Rule costume, but we also got the King K. Rule costume as a me fighter for the past Smash Brothers game. And that really upset a lot of people because it dashed their hopes that they were ever gonna get a proper character version of King K. Rule. Now I know that this sent a lot of people's hearts into the pit of their stomach, but I never for one second doubted that it wasn't a, a false first act, that there was a little bit more to this. I knew the real King K. Rule was gonna come up from behind 
King DDD, and of course, that's exactly what happened. The real King K. Rool did not appreciate that imposter, and he just smashes him out of the way. And now we have another amazing villain included in Super Smash Bros. And this is a good one. He fits right up there with Ganondorf and Bowser and Ridley. What a tremendous addition to the Smash Bros. cast this guy is. His movesets looks fantastic. At first, I was worried that a King K. Rool would be a little bit too similar to Bowser because they're both reptiles, they're both big and heavy, and they can push their weight around. But watching him in action, I did not get Bowser vibes at all. So I'm just, I think this is gonna be amazing. I know a ton of people are happy about this, myself included. It also reminds me what an incredible entertainer Mr. Sakurai is. He has such a tremendous grasp on the pulse and the pace and how to reveal information in the most dynamic and entertaining format possible. There's a lot of things where if you dig too deep into Smash Brothers stuff, it doesn't appeal to everybody. Not everybody cares about items or Pokemon or the menu or rules or different modes. Some people only care about characters. Some people can't get enough. G give me everything. But to bookend this presentation with these two character reveals, wow, just wow. Now that we've covered the heads and tails of the event, let's take a little bit of a look at the guts in between. The Smash blog makes sure to remind us that the Smash Ultimate website has been updated with new items, stages, and game modes. Actually, the direct shed some light on a lot of new items, Pokemon, stages, and music, not to mention a sneak peek at a number of the game modes. The best way to experience that is by checking out the Direct, but I just want to hit a couple of the highlights that really stuck out to me on the stage front. There are exactly 103 stages in Smash Brothers that includes Battlefield, Big Battlefield, and Final Destination. So if you subtract those three, that's 100 unique stages. Unlike previous Smash Brothers, every single stage has a battlefield and a final destination form, and every stage can feature eight player combat. Amazing, a hundred stages. I think that only leaves out like 15 past stages or so. Not many. Will they make a return? Hard to say at this point, but I do imagine we're we probably have not seen the final stage number, but even if this is it, they are definitely living up to that ultimate name. Now music, there are over 800 video game music tracks included in this game. 800! If you include all of the Smash Brothers music, like for menus and transitional materials, things like that, there are roughly 900. Convert that into hours, and you're looking at something like 28 hours of music? It's hard not to be impressed about that. That is really nothing short of, well, ultimate. So I can't mention the direct without mentioning the inclusion of two new Echo Fighters, one being Krom. He appears to be based predominantly on Ike, which would make sense because they do share some techniques. And if you happen to catch Paltana's guidance from Smash 4, there is a moment where Krom comes out and has a little bit of an exchange with Viridi where she literally calls him out on being too similar to Ike to make it into Smash Brothers, and there's no sense in having two characters that similar. Well, it turns out his similarity to Ike is actually what gets him into the game. I know Sakurai really wanted to have Krom in the game, but because he felt too similar to, well, the other Fire Emblem characters, he decided to go with Robin instead, who can differentiate himself with magic. So now the Fire Emblem Awakening trio is there and fully intact. I've heard Krom called the greatest dad in gaming. Now father and daughter can fight side by side, I know that uh, that speaks to me. I've never been a fan of the Fire Emblem series, but Smash Brothers has made me a huge Fire Emblem fan. I love the characters. I love the drama of their stories. Even if I've never played a single Fire Emblem game, except for Fire Emblem Heroes on my phone. Krom is certainly a welcome addition. Another welcome addition is an Echo Fighter of Samus in the form of Dark Samus. Dark Samus looks so cool. While she does have a very similar moveset, Dark Samus kind of like hovers there on the ground. Her feet don't actually touch. That's sweet. In the past, we have an alternate skin of Samus that resembles the appearance of Dark Samus, but this is so much better. I know a lot of people don't like having all these dark characters of other characters. Obviously, I don't have much of a problem with it. I really appreciate that as a gaming motif. I don't think that there's any opponent better than one's cell. So I think I mentioned in a previous one of these how in Zelda 2 The Adventures of Link, the only enemy that could be more personal for Link to face than Ganondorf is the dark side of himself. So Dark Pit and Dark Samus and Dark TJ are characters that I really enjoy and I love that she gets some special separate recognition in Smash Brothers. On the stage front, we have Dracula's castle. It looks so amazing. Not only do we have the castle, but all the classic monsters that you face in the Castlevania series make an appearance on this stage. You got the mummies, you got death, you have the werewolf, Frankenstein, and that little imp that sits on his shoulder. Man, that's awesome. Even Dracula himself, under 
certain conditions can make an appearance. They were purposefully very mysterious about that point, so I'm really curious what those conditions are. Then there's also a mystery villain that they took the time to showcase very briefly and then just left it like that without any further explanation. So I've been studying that little silhouette, trying to break down what it is, and I, I don't really know. I don't know if it's someone sitting in a chair or if it's a really ornate cape and two little legs sticking out. I don't know. If you have any ideas what that is, please let me know in the comments section below because I am racking my brain. Another stage I'm really excited about is New Donk City. Now, I've made no secret of the fact that I am not a fan of Mario Odyssey. It's the least Mario Mario game that I've ever played, but the best thing about that game is New Donk City, even though I still reject the weird, creepy looking human people. It's weird how the humans are the weird ones in that world. Honestly, in New Donk City, why wasn't everybody a Kong? Why, was, why wasn't it a city full of monkey denizens? That would have made a lot more sense to me. Amiibo Jason mentioned that to me and I thought, it's so obvious. Oh, the streets are named after monkeys. Okay, this is way off topic. But the stage is in Smash Brothers. It looks like if you can tag each of the musicians that it will trigger a musical number from our lady Pauline. That's pretty sweet. Another thing regarding stages is they are all available from the beginning. So there isn't gonna be any unlocking of stages, it doesn't appear. In addition to that, they all have a hazard toggle. So if you don't wanna be pestered by the yellow devil or some of the other hazards that appear on the stages, you can simply click off the hazard and it'll make your combat a little bit more focused on your opponents. Another new feature is stage morph, where you can actually pick two stages and sometime during the combat, one of those stages will morph into another one. What I thought was super cool about this is it's switching between the stages and I think that the more that they lean into making this specific to the switch, the more it's gonna feel like something new and the stage switching back and forth. I know it's kind of a little bit cheesy of a connection, but it has its charm to me. Also, if you're playing against somebody and you wanna have the home court advantage, then that's a good way to mix it up so that you and your opponent can at some point have home field advantage. I think that's kind of awesome. Another change I wanna briefly touch on is the sequence of events. The first thing that you do when you get into Smash is you set your rules. Then you select your stage and then you select your character. This is a change that I'm really happy with. I found it to be somewhat tedious to have to go in and change my rules every single time when I got into a new match. So the fact that you can just get that out of the way at the very beginning I think is a much needed upgrade. And stamina mode, which anybody who follows my content knows it's probably the one that I utilize the most. When I play the game, I like to play in, well, I guess regular Smash mode, but for all of my shows, stamina mode lends itself a little bit better to that because it has more of a definitive conclusion and it's easier to follow dramatically. Previously, this was featured in Special Smash. Now it's just one of the standard Smash modes. I love that. It makes it a lot easier to find. And it makes sense for it to be there too, in my opinion. Okay, and get this. You now have a gauge for your final Smash. If I understand this correctly, as you are fighting, your special gauge fills up and when it gets to the end, you can actually trigger your special Smash Final Smash during the battle without any kind of Smash Ball. I think that is amazing. I love these Final Smashers. I think a lot of work went into them, a lot of attention went into them, and they can be game changers, but because they were limited on the circumstantial appearance of a Smash Ball, I hardly ever got to see them. They had very little impact on the gameplay. But they're one of those show-stopping moments. They did mention that only one Final Smash can be triggered at a time. It makes a ton of sense why that would be. But having them just be included in every battle as a standard feature? I love that. I love that. We also get a new mode called Squad Strike. You can do 3v3 or 5 V5. This has a lot of appeal to me because there are groups of characters that I'm often torn between. Obviously, I'm a me main as I have made no secret of on this channel. I love to play as myself because I like to have my favorite Nintendo characters be uh, my, my wingmen and now I can literally do that. I can put me in the driver's seat and then have Link and Simon Belmont right behind me at my back. Or I can use my original NES Holy Trinity, Link, Little Mac, and Simon. Or I can five player smash and have Hero TJ, Dark TJ, and then Simon, Link, and Little Mac. Oh, I love this mode. This, is, this might be my new favorite mode. There's also a tournament mode. Hard not to get excited about that. Three years of my life have been dedicated to making a custom Smash Brothers for Wii U tournament, Smash Supremacy, which I'm almost ready to reveal the final episode. Stay tuned for more information about that. Maybe even as soon as this weekend. No promises. And then the final mode is Smashdown. Smashdown is where you pick a fighter to battle with in a Smash showdown with another fighter. 
and you can never choose the same fighter twice. So once a fighter's used, you have to move on to another fighter, which forces you to develop your skills with more than just one character. This mode really reminds me of Me V Me. So it's easy to see how all of these changes in game modes would have a lot of appeal to somebody like me. I wanted these modes so bad, I made similar versions for myself out of the past iteration of the game. So the fact that they're just in there as a standard mode, I'm excited. Can you tell I'm excited? I'm, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna I'll turn it down for you. I know it can get a bit obnoxious to hear an adult man squeak and squeal about his excitement for a video game. It's hard to contain. I'm like a shook up coke bottle right now. Classic mode makes a return. This time it sounds like each fighter has a predetermined selection of opponents. I kind of like that. I see a lot of ways how they can make that more character specific. Now that there's what? Close to 70 fighters in the game? Having to integrate every single character into a classic playthrough could make that a very long playthrough, which maybe doesn't lend itself well to a portable experience where you want to be able to make some meaningful progress in a game and, and then set it aside, but we'll see. We also got our first look at the menu. I'm happy to say it looks a lot cleaner than the random smattering that was the Wii U and 3DS, where you pretty much just had to dig to figure out what you were looking for, and they were randomly compartmentalized into these different headings that didn't necessarily make sense with what they were. Very confusing. While we didn't get a very detailed look, we did get to see inside this what the smash button looks like. And so far, I gotta say I'm digging it. There's also a mystery mode that they called attention to. So no detailed description of what that mode might be, the green button there, although a Twitter user by the name of at Noctulescent with his ninja grade VFX skills was able to de-pixelate this image by going frame by frame to determine that the word it says is spirits. This was also supposedly confirmed by the Japanese character used from the Japanese Direct, which really, knowing it doesn't unveil any more of the mystery because we still don't have much of an idea what spirits could mean, my hot take, and this is just speculation, I think we might be looking at a single player campaign. If you remember back in Brawl, we had all of these cool character cross cutscenes where all the different franchises cross paths through somewhat of a, a loosely strung together story outline called the Subspace Emissary. Each of these cutscenes were not that dissimilar to what these character reveals have been. If you remember back to the E3 reveal of Ridley, Ridley presumably slays Mario and Mega Man. We're only looking at the silhouette, but I they be dead. Or at least they look like they're dead. And then in the Simon Belmont trailers I mentioned earlier, death literally separates Luigi's soul from his body and it's hovering over him, looking at him. So far as I could tell, I didn't see anybody get killed in King K. Rule's reveal unless he smacked King DDD upside the head so hard that he be dead. So this is just connecting scattered dots, but maybe this spirits mode relates to that. If these characters are somehow being separated from their souls or their spirits, perhaps whatever this campaign is centers around collecting the spirits of these characters who are defeated by stage bosses or other characters in the game. Ridley has a history as a stage boss. Death is a stage boss. Maybe this has something to do with the conditions that require Dracula to emerge. If you have any ideas of what you think spirits might relate to as a selection on the Smash Brothers menu, I'd be curious to know. Let me know in the comments section below. I can't say enough what a thrill it was to watch the Smash Direct. Tons of good stuff, but that's all I'm gonna touch on here. For more information, give it a watch. Or check out my friends at NintendoWire.com. They've done some incredible breakdowns. My writer buddies Ben, Logan, Ricky, the whole staff, they really got some killer articles up there. And I'm not just saying that because I'm connected to Nintendo Wire. These guys do great work. Their articles and thoughtful breakdowns are totally tops. And they have literally detailed every single point, from items to music to stages, characters, <laughs> you name it. So do yourself a favor and check it out. On the topic of music, the music sample featured this week on the Smash blog is a Castlevania tune, Bloody Tears slash Monster Dance. These are the day and night themes from Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest. A super hard Castlevania game, the follow-up to the original Castlevania on the NES. I did play through this game. It is brutally hard and it's not very much like the first Castlevania. And the third Castlevania, Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse, is more of a return to form so that has the same feel as the original. I found Simon's Quest a lot more difficult and a lot less engaging, but the story of the game is probably the best in my opinion. You have to go around collecting body parts to resurrect a great evil. It's super morbid, very creepy, but really satisfying if you can actually pull it off. And the music in that game is unbelievable. I am well known from my friends and peers as a huge Legend of Zelda fan. Legend of Zelda is by far and away my favorite franchise. 
and in large part that is because of the incredible music of the Legend of Zelda series. So bear that in mind when I say if there is any series that rivals my love for the Legend of Zelda music, it is the Castlevania series. Those medieval gothic tones are so driving and compelling and eerie but yet also inspirational. Not an easy task to pull off all of those things at the same time. On any given day, I go back and forth between which soundtrack I actually appreciate more. Give this one a listen, guys. And the last two items featured on the Smash blog for this week are character highlights for Simon Belmont and King K. Rule. but because we already covered them in some detail with their reveal trailers, not much sense in rehashing that now. So that brings us to the end of another week, counting down the days to December 7th when Smash Brothers Ultimate releases for the Nintendo Switch. Thank you so much for counting down the days with me. I appreciate that you're here. I appreciate that you watch the show. If you sat through it this long and listened to this talking head, then why not join in the conversation. Honestly, my favorite thing about this is hearing what you have to say. The topic of the week has to be that mysterious spirits icon on the ultimate venue. Speculate with me. What do you think that's all about? I'm eager to hear your thoughts. Big thanks to all my patrons out there. You know I love you guys. To find out how you can support this show and all of my other content, there's a link to my Patreon page in the description below. If you want to join the battle and Patreon's not your thing, like this video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a single Smash Ultimate countdown. That's just about enough of me. We'll see you next time. Thanks for playing.